To answer the question who the human is, uh, the easiest uh, is to start uh, who a human is not. We understand that human is not a body, and it is very easy to prove. Uh, after all, do we control the processes inside our body? We do not control any of our life support processes in our body. How then can we be something that we cannot control? Let's imagine a company. So our body can be conditionally compared with the system unit and what is inside it. Very often we associate ourselves with our consciousness, our thoughts, emotions and external image. But uh, how can we control our thoughts? Each of us was faced with uh, thoughts, memories that we didn't want to see, didn't want to think, but the thoughts themselves climbed into our heads without our desire. We observed certain in the head. How can we then be them? We can only choose them. Also, uh, the fact uh, that human is not a consciousness is very well shown by Jackie's artificial consciousness, uh, which has the most powerful intelligence. But at the same time, if we disconnect it from the uh, outlet, it will cease to exist without a power source. Our own consciousness is software, uh, a set of uh, programs instead on our computer. In uh, religion, a human is also often acquired with the soul. However, the soul gives us life and uh, in uh, internal, immaterial source of vital energy in a human. And also, the soul is a door, an exit to another reality, speaking in the language of religion and culture, the spiritual world, nirvana, the absolute world of God. The fact that we are not soul is also very easy to prove. After all, if each of us felt, uh, felt it, felt the joy and the love inside. And if you ask a child where the soul is, he will accurately show the area of the solar plexus. We cannot be a soul if we feel it inside and observe the worms emanating from it. The soul is, in our example, can be figuratively compared to the electricity uh, supplied to a computer through an electric wire. And now we come to the answer to the question of who a human really is. Today at the conference we use the term personality to denote who we are. And the first time in the world the concept of who a human really is, is being heard openly. To feel like a personality, to separate from the body, consciousness and even the soul is not uh, easy at first. Personality is a silent observer making a choice where to put its attention in the body, in thoughts, emotions or in the soul. Um, our attention is able to defocus and uh, simultaneously be divided into several streams, but it is we as personality who control this process. Um, in example, uh, with a computer, we are the one who silently sits at the computer and controls the mouse, makes a choice which program to open and which file to print. Personality doesn't need anything in the world. He has no material interests. Uh, his only need is to return home, having entered the door of the spiritual world, to connect with the soul. The personality in his choice can develop, become stronger, strengthening the connection with the soul, or waste his attention on empty things. And this is the great gift to a human uh, possesses, to be free in his choice of who to be during the life. In all religions, there are knowledge preserved about personality, and always this knowledge is distorted because we count information that the human has a soul, but one soul uh, makes always it makes a choice, while the other soul is uh, giving the energy of life. Let us consider several uh, examples from various religions. Let's start with Egypt. From the pyramid text, we know that in ancient, ancient Egyptians had the knowledge of the components of a human, that a human consists of a physical body, a spiritual body, a heart. Also, there is a double, a soul, a non-material, a serial spirit, an image, and a name. The term ka was translated as a double, an image, a spirit, subconscious self. 
or, as we understand, it's human consciousness. Ba was dedicated in the texts as Ba birds, which continues to exist even after the body death. Uh, according to the verbal form of this word, which we found in some early texts, and it was found by specialists, it, uh, it is translated as the power of vital force. And Aho is the bodiless, transparent spirit, which is close to Ba, but differs from it. So Aho, speaking our language, is exactly the personality. Ancient Egyptians not just uh, distinguished between uh, elements of a human, but they also showed the trinary, ternary inter interconnection, like Ka, Ba, Ah, which indicated the human soul was related to personality and consciousness. Also in Egypt there was such a concept as Sah, which meant those who are in the state of bliss or saints. It was considered that Sahu are bow souls, spirits, uh, that achieved the highest level of power. It is interesting to know that on the Osiris's judgment where a person got up to death, the Ba soul was just aside, standing aside and went in for its destiny. Or, while on the scales there was Ah, or personality of a human, with all the deeds, and on the other scale there was the um, the feather of the goddess Ma'at. If personality was committing, uh, was making choice in favor of evil, it became a sealed sub-personality, while the soul was submerged in the material world again, and this process was symbolically depicted as well. The Osiris's judgment shows a very important point, that a human is not a soul, a human is a personality. But by making the right choice during lifetime, it can become a higher spiritual being, Sah. Uh, let's proceed to Christianity. In the very beginning of Old Testament, there are the following lines. The Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living house, uh, soul. Friedrich Brockhaus in his encyclopedia shows that to, note, to denote soul in Hebrew language, they use the term nefesh which is translated as breathing, inhaling. Also, according to Judaic tradition, the neshama is a bodiless and independent essence uh, beyond the body. As other expression, nefeshaya means something created a, a creature living creature created by god nefesh is connected to the body and cannot and can die so nishama is actually the bodiless soul while nefesh is human personality also it is very important that in russian for example uh, soul and spirit duch and uh, duch and dusha are very similar terms but in the original language they have uh, their own article and basically they are connected by kai a word from in the original language so soul and spirit and body are totally different substances alexander pavlovich lopuhin the biblicist writer and translator in his works he also notes that the human has three various substances which uh, according to the fathers of the church and also the pagan philosophers like plato neoplatonists and stoics uh, they mentioned that these three substances are in a human lopuhin indicates that a soul vivifies the body and is a successor of sensory perception and impressions and through the spirit a person recognizes God and here we again see the knowledge that a human is not the soul he is spirit or personality and thanks to the soul he can make choice in knowing getting to know God after the first Constantinople Council the concepts of the components of a human began to disappear Apparently, it was not beneficial for someone so that people who have pure knowledge of the spiritual nature and of the meaning of life of a person in general. In the Apocrypha, which are, far, which are on these councils were actually not included in the canonic Gospels, we read the following. In the Apocrypha on John, the spirit descends to people and will be transformed and saved. The power descends on everyone and without it. No one can even stand up without this power. And they are born, in, if the living spirit increases in them, power comes to them and their souls are strengthened. Also, there is a Pisti Sophia treatise of 2nd century. When a child is born, the power in him is small and the soul is small and the spirit is deceitful and also small. So all three parts are small, but little by little the power, the spirit and the deceitful spirit increase and 
each of them perceives according to their own nature. The deceitful spirit, however, finds all evil passions and various sins. The body does not perceive anything as itself. So, in the Apocrypha, we see clear knowledge of the soul and this, uh, and this personality, that personality emerges right after the body enters the soul, and the soul always nourishes personality and enables it to make a choice. And also about the deceitful spirit, which is consciousness, uh, we see that it also grows and tests a human. This information, this knowledge was also given to uh, in the Quran. In the Quran it is said that every person has his nafs, meaning his lowly desires, passions and thoughts, which is our consciousness, and we should fight our nafs, but a human is not nafs. In Surah 12, Ayah 85, we read that the soul is of, uh, has, there is a soul and the the soul is the affair of my Lord, and mankind have not been given of knowledge except a little. Also, we read in the Quran about the spirit, and he imprisoned into him from his spirit and gave him hearing, eyesight, and heart. Also, in the Quran, there is a direct appeal to people. Or don't you know, haven't we given to you? So the one who is actually addressed to makes the choice between Allah and Iblis. Allah has endowed a human with the freedom of choice. In Surah 18, the cave, Ayah 29, it is said, whoever wants will believe, whoever doesn't want, let them disbelieve. So a human is not consciousness now. It's neither body nor soul. A human is the one who chooses and has hearing and eyesight from the heart, meaning a human is personality. In the Restronism, the conscious choice of a human is described. O Ahura Mazda, you, are, you have embodied your spirit in various things and you gave mind and you gave life. Deeds and knowledge you created so that everyone could choose their way. In Zoroastrianism, there is Urvan concept, which is mean, which means the state of a soul in which a soul makes the choice. Basically, it's personality. Also, there is such a concept as devas. They constantly seduce Urvan, make him some evil, do him evil, but they are not human. They create conditions so that Urvan would make conscious choice and could come to Ahura Mazda as a mature being. So we can see that up to our days, of course, we have many information lost and distorted, and it was done intentionally, some through translations or from rewriting copy of the tests. In some places, personality is called the soul in some spirit in some somewhere this ah but the characteristics are similar and if you look at different religions all together we can trace these uh, similar features and we can answer the eternal question who am i in fact and what is my essence in all religions there is a concept of perishable body and non-material substances of a human personality is always under seduction and it can it should and must make its choice the soul is the door to god through the soul a, per a personality communicates with god and can achieve higher spiritual state only during lifetime through his or her personal choice but human is not a soul human is personality Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, thank you for such unique information. And um, if we look that in all religions of the world, in all cultures, this uh, information is still can be found. And uh, what is interesting, at what point does the personality appear in person? The personality is formed together with the appearance of the soul in the human body. When did this happen? You may have heard the common fairy tales that the soul is born in a person uh, from the moment of his conception, but it is absolutely not the case. The soul enters the body of the baby on the eighth day from the birth, and it is amazing that it can be uh, scientifically recorded. The soul, also an energetic substance, uh, but still entering the body, occurs the uh, property of uh, substance matter and gains a certain weight. The weight of a newborn on the eighth day increases sharply from 3 to 20 grams, and these can be uh, really 
fixed if you accurately control the weight of the newborn starting from the seventh day, taking into account the incoming and the outcoming stuff from it. On the eighth day, there is a sharp jump of the weight of the baby. It is on the eighth day then the child's eyes become alive, radiant, but you cannot but notice. It, uh, it is interesting that uh, this was known from time immemorial. So uh, this is uh, with the eighth day that the certain rites in different religions are associated. In the Old Testament, there was a law according to which the circumcision of a baby was supposed to be on the eighth day. Uh, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 21, we read, when the eight days until his circumcision had passed, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had given uh, conserved. Note, why did they have to give the name of Jesus again if it was given by an angel before the conception? Is it not because it was on the eighth day that the great soul of the Son of God entered the body of the infant? And even uh, before there were rituals of washing a newborn in the water and christening him uh, on the eighth day after the birth uh, was known to Romans who adopted this uh, tradition from other nations. In Buddhism, even today, the holiday of the uh, birth of the Buddha is celebrating uh, on the eighth day uh, of the fourth lunar month. Uh, as for the naming ceremony in Islam, uh, it is uh, held when the seven days have been passed since the birth of the baby, that is on the eighth day. D. Why there were these rites performed on the eighth day, uh, when the soul enters the baby's uh, body like a vessel? Because uh, they has knowledge that along with the souls, the personalities also go with it as a rule aggressive to the new personality. In order to protect the new personality from the tricks of sub-personalities, to minimize the initial stressful impact from them, as well as to give the new personality a positive boost in its future. Uh, since uh, ancient times, these rites were performed on the eighth day. The approximate location of the soul is the solar plexus area, but it is neither the solar plexus nor the heart of any other organ, brain, mind, or consciousness. The soul uh, has no gender, it is one and indivisible. The soul has no matter, it does not wait out, it does not seek. And souls of all people are uh, the same in their nature. And in some way, we can say that that uh, people are very close and related to each other. The soul is one in the person, but um, there is no animals, uh, there is no soul in the animals. And um, Dr. Uh, Duncan McDougall in 1907 uh, put forward the theory that a human's uh, soul weighs 21 grams. And um, in the course of experiment, he found out that variations in the body of the dead people occurred uh, but the, when the soul left the human body, but there were no variations in the body weights of the dogs. So it is important to know that uh, there is no reason to think that it is impossible for a soul to be reincarnated into plant, animal, or stone. And the fairy tales in some religions uh, about this came from a uh, distorial uh, of the simple understanding that after death, the particles of our body uh, disintegrate and uh, uh, enter to composition of these plants and animals. We will continue uh, the studying of this topic. Uh, and um, in addition to the changes in weight, the baby's gaze also on the eighth day, you you can record such um, a surge on the encephalogram, which lasts only for a few minutes, and the, uh, these births are repeated with an hour in total 12 times. We invite doctors and scientists to uh, join our research. And now, Sean, the anthropologist from Indiana, will talk about what uh, the person sent to reincarnation. Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends. So since the beginning of time, there was belief in the transmigration of souls, and this was very popular in many cultures, as we've heard today. This migration is called reincarnation. Let's see what reincarnation is and who actually re re reincarnates from life to life. And if so, if we look in the Oxford Dictionary, we will find a very clear explanation of this phenomenon. Re reincarnation is the rebirth of the soul in another body. Also from the Latin, Reincarnatio means incarnate again. In ancient Greek, the word 
metempsychosis is also literally translated as transmigration of souls. I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is the transmigration of the soul and not of the person himself or his consciousness. The idea of metempsychosis was not unfamiliar to the Western culture. Ancient Greek thinkers such as Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Plutarch, Plutonius, and others believed in the transmigration of souls. The concept of reincarnation was present in various ancient civilizations, as, as we just heard, especially among the Egyptians, the Babylonians. It's found in the Northern peoples of Europe, uh, the Indians of North America, and the Aborigines of Africa and Australia. If you look at the religious world, you can see that, that they also talk about the transmigration of, of the soul. For example, Buddhists compare the soul to a candle from the flame of which another candle was lit. It will be a new flame, but it will continue. It will, con it will con contain a particle of the first flame. So the soul of the, of the deceased will become the cause of the soul of the born. In Hinduism, there's also indications that is, that is the soul that is reborn. Transmigration of souls or reincarnation in Sanskrit, uh, punar janma, is one of the basic concepts of Hinduism. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 13, it is said, as the embodied soul continuously passes in, in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. Note that here again, we're talking only about the soul. There are quite a lot of such references in the Bhagavad Gita that you can, that you can reference. We know from the Quran that the individual consciousness of us is in, is in a new creation, but it does not say that this particular nafs will live in this new body. Moreover, the Quran says that a person is primarily an immortal spirit. And here we also see that it is not consciousness, but first of all, the spirit or the ruk that is reborn. And here, the main thing is to clearly understand that a person is not a soul. Uh, a person is a personality. That is, we see that from time immemorial, people have talked about reincarnation in all religions. But take note, it is the, it is the soul that transmigrates. But a person is not just a soul alone. A person is a personality, the soul and consciousness. We should entertain illusions that people have the chance to live another life after death. A person is only given one chance to gain eternal life. If he did not obtain it during, during his earthly life, he will never obtain it again. If he dies as a personality, it won't be him who reincarnates. His soul will reincarnate, and he will just be a thin coating, a subpersonality around it. Through this information and information that others have shared to, with us today, it becomes clear what's going on. You understand from your cultural perspective, you understand the general idea of reincarnation and the idea of a soul and a personality. And thanks to this conference, everything has become clear. All puzzles come together all pieces of the puzzle have come together. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. It's such profound information. And it is because of our speakers who understood that first of all, a human is neither a body, not consciousness, and not even the soul. That we are a personality. We have also known that the soul enters the body on the eighth day after the birth, and that only after appearing of the soul the personality emerges. And one more important answer we received that only human beings have souls. This is very important information. Only humans have souls. And exactly soul is that structure which is reincarnating in the other body. We have just heard about reincarnation in Islam, in, Buddh in Buddhism and Hinduism. And what will we see in Christianity? Did Jesus Christ, Christ speak about reincarnation? We are going to hear it from our next speaker, Denis Fabrichkin. Over to you. Hello, dear friends. I'm sincerely glad to welcome you today at this amazing conference. And I would like to thank you for this opportunity to participate in it, as well as for the fact that today this fundamental question about life after death is revealed so honestly and holistically. Because when we all honestly answer it together and find out the truth, 
It will be much easier for us to get rid of the fear of death and thereby take a huge step towards freedom, both for each person individually and for the society as a whole. Now let's talk about reincarnation in Christianity. Presently, the concept of reincarnation is disregarded in Christianity. But was it like that originally? And what did Jesus Christ say about this? We know from history that the first Christians freely believed in the rebirth of the soul, until they were forbidden to do so at the Ecumenical Council, which took place five centuries after Jesus Christ had come, that is, already when Christianity was the state religion of Rome. At that time, the belief in reincarnation was so widespread that it was necessary to convene a special council in 533 AD and declare the belief in reincarnation inconsistent with the orthodox dogmas. But as to why this happened and how this happened, we will discuss in more detail a little later. I would also like to note that naturally, after this concept had been anathematized, unfortunately, the Gospels were edited and those undesirable scriptures that were inappropriate were declared apocryphal. But today we still find both direct and indirect confirmation of what Jesus and his disciples said about the rebirth of the soul. To begin with, let's examine an excerpt from the Gospel of John. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Let me read it. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Interestingly, the very question of the disciples holds the answer and confirmation that they knew about reincarnation. Let's pay attention to this again. I will read it one more time. Who did sin, this man or his parents, they asked. The question arises as to how could he have sinned without being born yet. But this paradox becomes clear through the prism of the reincarnation concept. There is an even more interesting point. When Jesus says directly in direct speech about the rebirth of the soul, we find this in the Apocryphon of John. It is worth noting that up to this day many religious scholars use Apocrypha as sources of reference. Among them, there is the concept that there is the Holy Scripture, the Bible, and there is the sacred tradition, the Apocrypha, and they complement each other. Now, let's get back to the Apocryphon of John, or, as it is also called, the Secret Book of John, and read the following fragment. I said, Lord, how does the soul become smaller and return back into the nature of its mother, or the human? Then he rejoiced when I asked this, and he said to me, Truly you are blessed, for you have understood that soul is made to follow another who has the spirit of life in it, it is saved by that other one, then it is not cast into another flesh. Here we see that Jesus speaks directly about the rebirth of the soul. But John's question is also noteworthy. While reading this question, I recalled a fragment from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Let me first read a question from John, and then turn to the Gospel. Lord, how does the soul become smaller and return back into the nature of its mother, or the human? And now Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And here, in the question of Nicodemus, we also see a reference to reincarnation. It is important to understand that by the concept of reincarnation we mean the concept of the rebirth of the soul. But a person is not a soul. A person is a personality. And we already know this from what we have discussed a little earlier at the conference. That is, 
He is the one who decides whether to become an immortal spiritual being and go to the spiritual world by merging with the soul or by merging with consciousness to become a subpersonality. And it is in this life that we make a choice in. And responsibility lies with each of us. Jesus also spoke about this. He taught us that we are making a choice right now and that our after-death fate will be the result of this. Let me quote some of the words of Jesus from the Apocrypha Sacred Scripture and then I will comment on them a little. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. Here he directly says that those people who sinned and those people who did not work on themselves and did not love God and did not believe in Him, they will go, well, in fact, into the state of subpersonality, and the righteous will gain eternal life. Next, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Here Jesus says that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. Here we also see that if a person has sinned all his life, then he will not be able to get into eternal life. And if a person has walked the path of the son, right, that is, the path of love, then naturally he gains eternal life. Now let's turn to Apocrypha and find the following verses. In particular, there is an apocryphal Gospel of Philip, which says, while we are in this world, it is fitting for us to acquire the resurrection, so that when we strip off the flesh, we may be found in rest and not walk in the middle. Interestingly, just above, under the concept of middle, a concept of death is revealed. That is, in fact, a state of subpersonality, as to resurrection and what resurrection is can be found a little further in the secret book of John. There is also an interesting excerpt, let me read it too. I asked the Saviour, Lord, will every soul be saved and enter the pure light? He replied, saying to me, those upon whom the Spirit of life will descend and with whom it will be powerfully present, they will be saved and will become perfect. That is, in fact, to find salvation, to become resurrected while still in the body to be spiritually resurrected, enduring everything, bearing everything, so that they might complete the contest and inherit eternal life. Here he speaks about working on oneself and how a person develops spiritually. I said, Lord, then where will the souls be who do not know to whom their souls belong? He said to me, in those the despicable spirit has proliferated by leading them astray. He burdens the soul and draws it into the works of wickedness, and he casts it down into forgetfulness, and they bind it in chains until it awakens from forgetfulness and receives knowledge. And in this way it is perfected and saved. Here it is actually said that the soul is reborn again and again until one of the personalities merges with the soul, so a new spiritual being is born. I would like to say that we do not in any way oppose Christianity. We just want to know the truth, because mentions about the rebirth of the soul have been preserved for a reason. So when we restore this knowledge holistically and look at it, then we see that the truth that Jesus spoke gave people freedom, awakening their souls and it also freed people from the fear of death. But at the same time, people understood that the responsibility for the after-death fate lies with each person individually. Unfortunately, as of today, the proper understanding of the life after death has been lost. And as a result, what we see today is the kind of world we live in. However, the first followers of Jesus were not afraid of death. They knew about reincarnation, about what is hidden beyond that edge. We will talk about this a little later. Now I would like to express my gratitude once again for the opportunity to participate in this conference, for preparation for it, for the fact that in principle we raised this question. So while preparing for the conference, we considered it from different angles, from different positions, seeing how much has been said in the world about this, how many researchers, how many people are selflessly researching this issue, how many people have already learned the truth, what was said in religions, how it was kept back, what was left. When one sees all this, 
They perfectly understand the truth, and this comprehensive picture, being accepted firmly inside, makes it possible to change the quality of life itself now. And in fact, begin to appreciate life itself and treat it truly with respect and gratitude. For the fact that we have a great opportunity, for the fact that we have a chance and that we can make a choice in favor of life. I even would like to express my gratitude to all people who take part in researching this, all the people who prepared this conference and in general raised this question, because this is a bold question, and the answer to it is very important for each of us. This is a great care about people, this is a great help to all of us. Thank you very much, friends, and let's continue our discussion on this topic. I am giving the floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for your significant speech. Now, dear viewers, let's add to our picture a little bit more details. Watch the fragment of the video with participation of Igor Mikhailovich Danilov, Life After Death. And I said, Lord, those, however, who have not known to whom they belong, where will their souls be? And he said to me, in those, the despicable spirit has gained strength when they went astray, and after it, the soul comes out of the body, it is handed over to the authorities who came into being through the archon, and they bind it with chains until it is liberated from the forgetfulness and acquires knowledge. And if thus it becomes perfect, it is saved. Yes, here the process of reincarnation of the soul is exactly described, but not of a human being. So, it turns out that a human as personality lives only once. The soul will be reincarnated. However, you are not the soul, my friends. In order to become a soul, you have to complete the first phase. You have to merge with it. While in order to merge with it, you have to get rid of all those bad things, of those stones on your road that you even carry with you. Only then, can you stop the process of reincarnation of your soul? The soul is not yours. In fact, it will become yours only when you become part of it. In the meantime, it is a carrier that gives you life. It is the power that creates you as personality and the power that creates your secondary consciousness, which distinguishes you from animals. Nothing more than that. But when a person doesn't know how to do this or he is deluded, then the outcome is as simple as that. And subpersonalities will form around the soul until a personality appears who, after merging with the soul, will go to the higher world, become an angel or bodhisattva, whatever you like more. Only then all subpersonalities will be destroyed in the literal sense of the word. Until then, a human being as personality, having become a subpersonality, will live, will exist. And this is what was called hell. Well, we will touch upon that later, because in this apocryphon there is also a continuation. If you've already started, let's move on. And I said, Lord, how can the soul become smaller and return into the nature of its mother or into man? And he said to me, Truly you are blessed, for you have understood that soul is made to follow another one, since the spirit of life is in it. It is saved through him, it is not again cast into another flesh. Right. And here is the spirit of life, meaning a spiritualized body. And here is a phenomenon too. This is also mentioned in other Apocrypha, and in more ancient times it was clearly said that on the eighth day the soul enters a body. Yes, and Jesus Christ talked about this. He could not avoid mentioning it. Why? Because He knew that. And He had to tell His disciples about that too. And He surely mentioned it. It's just that, you see, history was remade and the truth was destroyed. As we can see from just one Apocryphon, this is really so. And precisely the soul enters another spiritualized body, the living body, but enters it on the eighth day. That's 
When a human being becomes a human being, there is personality, soul and consciousness in him. And that's where everything begins again. So first, the Christians knew about the reincarnation process. This information is absolutely eye-opening. Finally, the truth becomes accessible and it was always there. And now you can see that people themselves return truth to each other and that is so joyful. So we have addressed reincarnation from the religious point and now let us look at it from the point of science. The floor is all yours, Mr. Kurotikov. This is a very interesting question that has really been troubling humanity for many millennia. There are several points of view. There is the materialistic point of view, that everything ends and disappears. And there is, let's say, rather a metaphysical point of view, that after death there is some continuation. Both points of view are unprovable, meaning you can only believe. You can believe that there is a God, or you can believe that there is no God. Those are the two types of faith. In the same way, we can apply this to those who believe that there is nothing after death and to those who believe that there will be something. I belong to the second category and I believe that after death consciousness is preserved in some form. Well, so far we cannot tell for how long, but we have plenty of evidence that after death a very complex process of transformation takes place. We say that death is a transition, a transition from the material body to some other state. We call this state informational. We say that there exist other worlds that are parallel to our materialistic world. And the simplest thing that is now proven and beyond doubt is that there is a quantum world, but it is completely different, it has other laws, it has other principles, and this is beyond any doubt today. Theoretically, everyone already knows that there is such a thing. We believe that there are other spaces, informational spaces, spaces where immaterial entities exist and where a person's consciousness can also exist after death for a certain period of time. There is a lot of proof for that nowadays, more and more scientific facts on this subject are accumulated. In particular, the after-death human studies have been conducted for a long time and there are very interesting results. Such studies are extensively conducted in America as well as in France and Germany. So, yes indeed, we believe that after death our informational essence, our soul, if you want to call it that way, is preserved. However, what happens to it afterwards, we can only guess. I am radically against the idea that a person can reincarnate into an animal. Absolutely not. Still, I believe that we... Again, what does it mean to reincarnate? It doesn't mean that you, with all your memories, all your physiological sensations, go into another body. It isn't so. This means that a child who is born receives certain information about a past life of another person. He gives out some of this information on a conscious level. But it does not mean that this person, Uncle Vasya, has migrated into little Sasha. It is useless to hope that later on you will become a guru or a millionaire or live somewhere. There is no such thing. And all attempts, for example, to freeze the body, to unfreeze it, I think it's all about business again, which has nothing to do with reality. Hence, you have to live here, now, and try to embrace this life in its fullness and in its joy, regardless of all its problems, unpleasant moments and limiting factors. Good evening. Good evening.
Good evening. Thank you very much for your opinion, your story, your information. Today we already found out what the soul, personality, consciousness are. And now we have to ascertain what a personality is. So we have come to the conclusion that if during one's lifetime there is no merging of personality with the soul, then after death of the physical body and destruction of the energy structure, this intelligent personality turns into a sub-personality. When the body dies, the physical body dies, a human being continues existing. Human personality continues to exist just in a different form, in a form of a sub-personality. In other words, it's an intelligent informational structure of the material world. So, it turns out that this personality, it is just like you, but it was active in previous incarnations of your soul, but unfortunately this personality has made a wrong choice. That is why it turned not into an angel spiritual being, but it became a part of the material world. After the death of the body, personality, who becomes a sub-personality, gains its own experience and understanding of what actually the material world is, and what the soul is, and what is the importance of the soul for a human being. But in the energy structure of a new body, sub-personality is already in the desperate state of a locked in intellect or mind and this mind understands everything it uh, has sensual pain but cannot do anything and it can uh, cannot transfer its experience to the new personality you know it's the same as if you're locked in a body but this body does not serve your consciousness and uh, does not obey you and this body does not do what you command it to do so friends the state of subpersonality is not some amusement or joy it's it is pain it is loneliness and a feeling a sensation of heaviness and despair and of course in order to somehow relieve its condition if we can actually call this life or this existence actually subpersonality can use the energies of a new body uh, only until the moment when personality new personality matures subpersonality gains temporary existence and power and thanks to its projections it can go to other places and visit people whom he or she uh, was attached to during lifetime. Also, subpersonality can manifest its action when living people recall this deceased person, endowing it, him with uh, actually with the power of their attention. You know, it is interesting for me how fast actually after the death of the body, a human turns into subpersonality, and you know, it is almost instantaneously. In a new body, subpersonality is not at once, it doesn't get there immediately. We already know that the soul enters a human body on the eighth day, and if a person dies and there is a child, newborn child, n not, not so far from that location, it's a seventh or eighth day, so the soul which just left the deceased person's body, this soul will, uh, after some 12 minutes, so a little earlier, it will enter the body of a newborn child, baby, who is about eight, eighth day. This will not be some other person, it will be that particular soul which just left the deceased body's person. And this soul will settle together with the previous personality, which un who unfortunately didn't merge with the soul. So, basically, uh, it's several, some several minutes, 12 minutes takes a person to become a sub-personality. But if a person goes to Nirvana, no psychic can take him back for a contact, just like the person who is still at the stage of re uh, reincarnation, rebirth between the worlds. So from everything I've just said, we should conclude that every person who is now living on this planet has only one chance, either to go to Nirvana, become a part of high society or an angel, and we have this one life, friends, and this friend, uh, and this life of ours is here and now. And whatever we fill our life with, what kind of thoughts, deeds, and words, 
This is what will remain with us after death. Our offense, our anger will not disappear anywhere. And the most sorrowful thing is that it will increase after our death. If during our lifetime we were living by anger, offense, and we preserving them. So the choice is up to us. And now I suggest that we will watch an associative video about the soul, personality, consciousness. Let's imagine that the torch is a soul. The light from the torch is the life energy coming from the soul. The torch shines into a mirror. What appears in the mirror is the personality. The personality is a reflection from the soul, and the reflection from the personality is a secondary consciousness. The secondary consciousness is what distinguishes human consciousness from animal consciousness, which provides imaginative thinking, intelligence, and so on. The clearer the flashlight, the brighter the personality, and the more developed the secondary consciousness can be. The energy that goes from the soul to the personality can either be directed back to the soul or feed the secondary consciousness. It's up to the personality where to direct the energy. To explain what subpersonality are, let's take a familiar method of torch and a mirror. Subpersonalities are a kind of foggy light filters on the soul. The degree of darkening of such a light filter subpersonality depends on the dominant life choices, preferences, and sensory emotional priorities accumulated by the former personality from a previous life. The more the animal side dominated in the previous personality, the more material values prevail, the more difficult it will be for a new personality late. If there are many subpersonalities with dense light filters, then it is very difficult for a living personality to turn from the path of material dominance to feel his soul because connection between the source of light and the one who needs it is darkened. However, if a person comes into contact with the true knowledge, no matter how difficult the circumstances are, no matter how many dark light filters are around his soul, the personality still has a chance in life to unite with its soul and become a new spiritual being. Because if a person sees even the slightest source of light in a dark cave, he will definitely find a way out of the cave. Attention is our most valuable resource. What do we light up with our attention? Note that if we light on grief, it is impossible to light on happiness at the same time. Where we put our attention is what we give life to. Why light up the grief? Let us light up happiness.